I know what you're thinking. Ryan, why on God's green earth do you need to be taking on another extremely detailed project? You already whinge about having no time. Well, I'm glad you asked. This is something I've wanted to do for a long time, and it will finally allow some of the creative freedom that I've really wanted to not only explore, but also share with you. You wanted details, this will facilitate that, plus I think it'll make for a pretty cool race car. And who doesn't love race cars? People are always telling me how they appreciate and would like more info about what goes into a project, and to be honest, a lot of what I will show now is possibly not as sexy as some of the other aspects, but they are still necessary and really the sort of things that take up probably three quarters of actual time spent on a project. So perhaps consider this installment a little behind the scenes, and let's recap. The K70 is basically a streeto car. It's getting the turbo, but it needs some suspension and brake upgrades, and very soon I'm sure that the 4K is going to give up the ghost. Being that I've decided to do this twin cam head design for the K engine, I'd like to put that in the white K25, and seeing as the 5K in the car now is pretty healthy, I think I'll put that into the K70 when the 4K dies. So I've got this K25 shell here which is perfect for scanning the engine bay and getting all the suspension mounting points, but then I've also got some spare K70 suspension gear which I can modify to fit in here. Depending how that shapes up, I can do majority of the work for the swap on the white K25 without having to take it off the road in order to figure everything out. I'm also having more time. Correct. Correct. Not only that, I have ease of access to the firewall and the spare pedal box to allow redesign of that, including the accelerator setup. When it's not full of all these spare parts, the floor pan is also free for me to design the center console, seat mounting points, and some other things in there. Once I do that though, I'll have a lot of design aspects covered that could be reused to turn this into a pretty cool track car. This shell is pretty much beyond saving for street registration, so why not use it to try out some more ideas I have that would probably be pushing the limits a bit too far for a street car. In Victoria anyway. So let's get into the details. The main thing I'm concerned with right now is getting a scan of the engine bay and relevant pickup points for the suspension. My initial thoughts are that I'll try and swap the K25 cross member for a K71, and an added benefit of that will be changing to a rack and pinion steering as opposed to the steering box of the K25, which is less than ideal. Essentially inside this housing here is a worm gear meshed with some ball bearings and a sector gear. As you turn the steering wheel, you translate that movement via the gears to this pitman arm, which is then attached to the center link. You can see that the movement of the link is restricted by these end stops, which you can adjust to limit the extent of the movement in each direction. On each side is a tie rod, and as the center rod is moved left and right, it pulls on this knuckle arm on each side. What's missing from this shot here is the upright, but that's basically what attaches the suspension to the body and also secures and locates the wheel. You can imagine now as you're turning the steering wheel, how that translates to the movement of the wheels. It's not the time for a deep dive, but briefly, while they're robust and simple, steering boxes generally are less precise, and as they wear, they have no real form of adjustment. Conversely, steering racks are more lightweight and precise. Next on the list is the clutch arrangement. Both the K25 and the K70 are a cable clutch from the factory, although the K25 has been converted already to a hydraulic setup. Instead of feeding straight out of the firewall here, it basically runs a rod across to this master cylinder which then controls the system. There's nothing wrong with it as such, but I'd like to have a go at coming up with the design myself. Plus, I think I should be able to feed it directly out of the firewall, as is the case with most conventional setup. An example of a potential issue that that might cause is visible here on my 180SX, where I've gone to an aftermarket intake manifold, and as such, clearance on the clutch master is very tight. So that's another reason why scanning the engine bay will help multiple aspects of these projects. I'll be able to help account for clearance considerations with the head design, while also being mindful of the clutch and brake arrangements and steering adjustments. Maybe I might even be able to fit a brake booster in there. So let's talk about scanning. I'm using the Morocco Plus 3D scanner from RevoPoint, which you've seen me use already on a couple of other aspects of these projects. Previously, you've also seen me use the developer spray to assist with getting some of the finer details, but this time I'm just going to see what sort of scan I can get without any adjustments. 
The rusty patinaed surface is surely helping a bit with this by reducing reflections, but the ability to scan without using any markers is really great and I've got no complaints. As I usually do, I try and get a bunch of detailed overlapping scans and then align and merge them together. I did realize that I was yet to actually try the alignment tool on my computer rather than the scanner, so I decided to also try connecting via Wi-Fi for the first time. I think it might have been even quicker to connect and send rather than the cable to be honest, and this view makes it a little easier for you to see the level of detail in the scan. This is a good first test, as I will also attach an upright so that I can scan the complete K25 suspension before swapping to the K70 crossmember, etc. There is a lot involved in a suspension design, so for now that one is certainly a bit further down the list. You can see already that it's coming out pretty well, seeing as I've got the scanner out and I'm sure at least one of you might have thought to yourself, well, if you do actually build this track car, then what engine are you going to put in there? Well, I'm glad you are. I'm in the mood for some blasphemy and I've got this spare SR20 here, along with manifolds, turbos, gearboxes and diffs. While they do look pretty sitting on the shelf, it's probably about time I actually put them to some use. Another feature of the scanning software that I'm yet to show is the manual alignment tool, which sometimes can be needed if the auto alignment won't work. You essentially manually select the points in the same position on both models, telling the software how to align the parts. You can see here it produces its best guess each time, and in this case, by the third point, it's got it bang on. It is still a very quick, rough model, but let's have a look at how it might fit in the engine bay. So this quickly shows how it might initially look together, as well as what areas are missing from the scan that I can go back and pick up. We've already done a scan of the 5k block, and even just throwing that in there we can immediately see how much bigger even just the block of the SR is in comparison. While the scanning is working well, this engine is just absolutely filthy, and I have been curious for some time now to determine the actual cause of the failure. For that, I'll need to tear it down, so let's bring it in the garage. And while I'm collecting parts for the rebuild, something has arrived in early anticipation of that. These are some forged H-beam conrods from Max Peating Rods. They're 4340 chromoly and are already balanced and ready to go. They also come with ARP hardware and honestly the quality looks great. I've never personally used these before but a number of friends swear by them so I'm keen to try them out. I'm a fan of this laser etching on here and that's a little foreshadowing for you. Holding them by themselves doesn't really give you much context though so let's continue this tear down and pull out one of the stock rods. It's actually pretty nice to not be in a rush and just be able to take my time pulling this apart. It obviously has already been partially disassembled prior to this, which makes it a little easier. I'm trying to actually remember what I was told about this engine, but I can't remember anything other than it's said to have been out of the Type X 180SX and that it's been sitting for over 10 years. Deceptive I know, looks to be one owner, never abused. I should probably invest in one of those fancy drip trays for engine stands, but in the meantime, this is the process. There's no obvious or unreasonable wear to the top of any of the pistons or the cylinders. I'm guessing some sort of rod knock, so let's flip it over and have a look under there. The sludge in the bottom of this engine is just crazy. The water in the ultrasonic is almost certainly as saturated as it's going to get, but while I'm busy pulling the rest of this apart, I might as well throw the sump cover in and see what happens. There must be something wrong with my brain because all I want to do is drop everything and clean every aspect of this engine. I'm going to stay on target though, I will chuck this in the ultrasonic just to see if it does anything, but I think this one's going to be a job for degreaser and the pressure washer, at least initially. You can see the water line there where it's done a little bit of cleaning, but not much. It's an air powered one as well.
At this point it's basically just muscle memory, but I'll chuck it in the ultrasonic anyway for a little bit and see how it goes. Yep, these are going to need some degreaser and the pressure washer, so in the meantime, let's get back to that foreshadowing. You might have seen this sitting in the background of some of my past videos, and it's finally time to put it to some use. Creality sent me out this Falcon Pro 2 to try out in the workshop, and I've been playing around with it a bit, trying to work out some settings. Normally for something like this, I'd do a whole bunch of reading and research first, but I've just decided to dive in. My main purpose for wanting to try this out is for etching some parts, which I'll come to shortly, but also for some more creative projects as well, both for my fat lip stuff and some things for our tattoo studio. Here I'm just running a material test, which essentially etches squares on a speed versus intensity chart, so you can see how the material reacts. I also printed some plastic samples just to see how it'd behave, as well as a larger indexer for setting the height of the laser, so I can measure more easily from the bed height rather than just the workpiece. Here's the cat of that, because the camera hates the shiny black PETG. The plastic performed basically how I expected it to, and in the case of all the samples, I stopped the test when I could see the laser was going to burn through. The machine has a camera built in, so you can photograph your bed layout and then place your design appropriately. You can also then frame your piece with the laser at a very low power level, which will let you check that your design is going to land where you want it to. As you would expect, the PLA warped pretty quickly. Although I was running the machine's fan through a filter, upon thinking more about it, it's probably not good for your longevity to be burning PLA or PETG in any case, so it's probably somewhat of a pointless exercise. And I moved on to some metal. I did encounter this lens issue a couple of times, I suspect it's mainly due to using the laser on an unclean surface, and or I possibly need to increase the air pressure. Either way, it was a very quick and simple fix to take the head off and clean the lens with some isopropyl. I was ready to jump up to some more solid parts, and although I'm pretty sure of what the outcome is going to be when I use the laser on the unfinished surface, I still think it's worth going through the process. As I suspected, the scale on the surface has been a little tricky to get through at that power level. I could either up the power or clean the surface. As you can see, I've elected to remove the scale. Being that this is a diode laser as opposed to a CO2 or a fiber laser, you can see it hasn't done too well with the reflective uncoated surface. You can purchase specific coatings to assist with that, but I don't have any of those. What I do have though, is a permanent marker. It's definitely worked better than before, and I think with some tweaking to some other settings I can get a decent outcome. So I cleaned off some more scale and ran some tests at various speeds and intensities. As you can see, they came out pretty well, so I ran one more test with a solid infill on the scrap steel, and then I thought I might try it out on one of the 4K con rods. The camera doesn't show it too well, but it's come out nicely. Finally, Creality also sent out this fourth axis rotary attachment, for which I've got a couple of ideas, one of which I wanted to initially try now, which is etching the notch profile of a tube, which is better represented in the CAD here. Probably, obviously, I don't really have a need for this on a 3 inch stainless tube, but it's some scrap I had laying about, which shows the effectiveness of the laser on stainless, as well as the notching concept. I think it's come out nicely, and I'll keep pondering that idea in the background. I did also do one more brief test on some anodized aluminium extrusion. I'm already working on something with Jess to be made out of timber, but that's for another day. For now, I've been instilled with enough confidence to test the laser on something that isn't a scrap piece. Okay, so in typical fashion, I'm getting a little ahead of myself here, but I would like to measure and check a couple of dimensions on these con rods. The website states that the big ends are a 51mm diameter, and to measure that, I'm going to use a snap gauge or a telescoping gauge. I'll preface this segment by saying I'm neither a machinist nor an engine builder, but this is how I've gone about it. I actually picked up a whole bunch of measuring tools from a garage sale a few years ago, including this snap gauge and some micrometers and dial gauges. I know that you can pull these apart and clean them in order to get them working really nice again, but I've got a few of these and I'm conscious of the rabbit hole that'll send me down. You would normally use a micrometer rather than a pair of calipers to measure the distance of your gauge. This is mainly because micrometers are meant for finesse in measurement and you can also more easily impart too much force with calipers, which I'm over exaggerating here. That said, I'm not actually sure of the accuracy of this micrometer. I do have this 2 inch gauge block or standard, which I also don't know the accuracy of, but let's check anyway. 
It looks pretty close, but I think it's going to need a re-zeroing, which is more than I want to attempt today, as I will also clean it at the same time. You can see in this other one I have here that they will usually come with their own standard and a spanner to allow for adjustment. I did try it a few times and I got measurements that were kind of close, but certainly not within acceptable tolerance. A quick sanity check, even with the calipers, shows a much more reasonable 51.04 millimeters. I will need to measure them all properly, along with the crankshaft when I order bearings and pending if the crank needs any work as well. In the meantime, that OEM piston has cleaned up pretty well, so let's separate it from the conrod. I naturally removed both circlips on the first try without slipping, like I always do. Now comes a situation that I've been avoiding. I could just use a socket extension to push the gudgeon pin out, but I have another job for which I need a drift about this size, so I'm just going to make one. It'll make me feel better. No drawings or funny business. I'm just gonna wing it and turn it down to the needed size and clean it up a little. For all of you hoarders out there though, these pegs have been in my maybe later pile for over 15 years and now they're finally getting some use. So it's essentially justified my continued hoarding for at least another 15 years. Because you never know. Good enough I reckon, let's go put it to some use. If you haven't signed up on the website yet, these little adjuster knobs are still up there for free download, so check it out as well as some of the other things I've got available. Now that we're finally doing a comparison to the two rods, we can see just how much beefier the new ones are, especially up towards the small end. My amazing intuition is also telling me that these forged ones also feel a fair bit lighter. But how much lighter? Pretty interesting. The forged ones work out to be 130.5 grams lighter, which across the four of them is over 500 grams off the rotating assembly, whilst also increasing the strength and balance. It did get me curious about the 4 and 5k rods as well, being that the 5k ones are simply beefier rather than optimised, we can see that while they visually look stronger, they are consequently heavier. For those of you watching closely, I did actually weigh a 4k rod with both bolts and nuts. To the piston and wrist pin now, we can see a decent amount of wear on the pin, which can be a sign of dirty or low oil, as well as high sustained RPM. Paired with this wear on the bearing, and this little guy here, my money would be on too much boost and sustained RPM, causing detonation. Most likely also mixed with poor oil maintenance, which is a common theme with these engines. So, where's that leave us? I'm hopeful that the rest of the SR teardown will go well, so for now, I'm confident enough to say that I'll be using that engine in the track car. I've got some things in the works to manufacture some parts to finish off the turbo setup in the KE70, and I've also now collected enough parts to put together a video for the twin cam head design for the K engine. But I would like to re-register the K25, so I think the next thing on my list is going to be to finish off that switch panel design. So let me know what you thought in the comments below, and as always, thanks for watching. Frustration and rage, suicide rates constantly raised, and I'm amazed. Graduating, maybe you can work the rest of your life. Education, force and dreams and aspirations aside, y'all get the picture. These kids are falling victim to a system, raising money hungry in a food scarce prison. And when that prison is the building blocks for a whole generation, it takes someone great to instigate some separation. Know what I'm saying, so stand alone, fucking stand tall, dog. You can always get up higher than you fall, dog.